It's my pleasure to introduce Scott Monty. So Scott has successfully introduced potent social media strategies to some of the biggest brands in the world. The Economist ranked him among the top five social business leaders and Forbes identified him as one of the top 10 influencers in social media today. Before signing on as Executive Vice President of Strategy at Shift Communications, he was head of social media function at the Ford Motor Company. Help me give me a warm welcome for, uh, for Scott Monty. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest night of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. So if you're wondering why I would open a keynote with Robert Frost on, a, uh, stopping, on stopping by snowy woods in New England, yes, it was to get your attention, but it was also a nod to the title that you may have seen for this presentation in your little booklets around your neck, which if you're like me, you can't get it far enough away from your face to actually read. <laughs> And that is the unfulfilled promise of social media. And if we think of that poem as an allegory, the woods are the places where our customers dwell, the communities, the online spaces, the places where they're having conversations. And they are indeed lovely, dark, and deep. And we as marketers or as brands have always had the promise of social in front of us, this conversational platform. And we have miles to go yet before we realize that promise because as you can see the updated title of my talk is that have we lost our way? We still do have miles to go before we sleep. So uh, just quickly about me, I spent six years as the global head of social media for Ford Motor Company. And let me tell you, I saw it all. Uh, I was there, I actually joined 10 days before Ford filed an $8.7 billion quarterly loss, the largest in its history. And it was the beginning of the carpocalypse. It was an absolutely astounding time to be part of the U.S. automotive industry and certainly a great time to be part of Ford. One of the reasons I went to Ford is because I wanted to be part of a comeback story. I wanted to help build something. And I saw social on the same trajectory as Ford with regard to product offerings and mainstream acceptance and, you know, kind of a changing reputation. And I left Ford earlier this year and I joined Shift Communications, which is the most progressive PR and social agency, headquartered in Boston with offices here in New York and San Francisco, because I want to be part of a team that's building something. And what we do at Shift is we base our value to clients on analytics and data-driven PR. Right? We're trying to help communicators understand that numbers are not bad and helping them to mix their marketing results with their communications results and drive insights from the data. You know, one of my pet peeves, just I'm gonna get it out there, is, is big data. Everybody talks about big data. I would appreciate little insights every now and then. You know, screw the big data. Let, let's just glean some insights from what we already know. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the presentation. And I apologize, normally I do not work with notes but I've been changing this presentation up until just about an hour or two ago, so um, this is about as fresh as it gets, folks. 
So let's think about what one of the major challenges that every brand has right now. It's trust. And if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, which has been an annual survey that's been happening over the last dozen years or so, every year we see that there is a trust problem. Trust in businesses, trust in the media, trust in the government, certainly, and NGOs to a certain degree. Right? So we've got this underlying issue. And trust feeds directly into reputation. Okay? And reputation is what feeds purchase consideration. You know, the slide that Andrew showed about customers not wanting to buy, 80% of customers not wanting to buy from somebody that's got negative reviews, that's your reputation. Right? And trust feeds right into that. So who do people trust? Well, they primarily trust experts, academics, but most importantly, I think, they trust people like them, people like them. You think about the last time you've had to make a purchase decision in your life about a major product. Maybe it's an iPhone or a Samsung if you're not into bendy phones. Maybe it's a car, maybe it's a flat screen TV. What have you done? You've talked to people that you respect and trust. Your family, your friends, your coworkers, your peers. People that you know online, and maybe people that you only know from online. Right? This is how decisions are being made. So let's take a quick look at how trust is playing out um, in the media lately with a few examples. Anybody hear about this with Comcast? This just broke this week. It's a story of a guy whose bill had been screwed up by Comcast for nine months after he had repeatedly told them of what they had done. They were overcharging him. They were double charging him. They gave him equipment that he didn't need and charging him for that. Well, the guy's an accountant. And he made a list and a spreadsheet of exactly everything that happened. And he brought it to Comcast. And he said, look, you've, you've charged me $1,800. <laughs> and what did they do? They delivered more equipment to him. So he's, he, he was just fed up. And he went you know, higher up in the organization. He said, look, I'm an accountant. I think he may have said who he worked for, which is Price Waterhouse, which happens to be an accounting firm that Comcast uses. I'm not sure whether that part's true or not, but what happened is Comcast researched who he was, and they went to his employer, and they got him fired. All right, that's the ultimate in customer service, right? <laughs> well, just yesterday, Comcast's newly appointed senior VP of customer experience, a role that was just created two weeks ago, put out a blog post publicly apologizing to this customer. It's not clear whether he has his job back, because that's a decision by some other boneheaded managers at a different organization. But the point is, Comcast is taking steps to try to re repair its long-damaged reputation. And it certainly didn't need another example like this. Um, you know, it's funny. We, um, we just heard about uh, the, the, the geolocation stuff from Andrew. And I don't know if you heard on Monday, Facebook announced that it's turning on geofencing for targeting for local businesses, small and medium businesses. So when you visited an area or when you're in a particular area, they can target you with ads or even with directions to help you get to the store. And I'm sure that's going to freak a lot of people out up front. And Facebook has a knack for freaking people out. All right, did you hear about the experimentation that they did with people's news feeds earlier this year? They were tinkering with what people saw, about 700,000 people. And they were trying to determine, is their mood heightened or lowered by what they see? They're basically doing a psychological experiment. And the joke's on us, because Facebook is one giant psychological experiment that's been going on for 10 years. But the point is, they got caught, and they got called out by it. They, and there was commentary in the news by experts 
academics and research experts who said, look, this is not the way we conduct human research. Have we learned nothing in the past decades? And people were so upset and continue to be so upset with different aspects of Facebook because you can't trust Facebook. They screw with your privacy settings. They pull this kind of stuff on you. They just they throw these big decisions out. The market goes crazy. They retract for a couple of weeks. And then they slowly creep back and introduce the product again when you're not looking. And the expectation is you'll get used to it. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you followed, there was a, another uproar that uh, some drag queens were upset that they couldn't use their stage names on Facebook. Facebook said you have to use your real names. And they had some very personal, very private reasons for wanting to maintain their persona. And what ended up happening is people fled to Ello. You guys hear about Ello? Right? So Ello, which is, th their manifesto is basically, look, we're not going to sell your data to advertisers. They're, they're basically setting themselves up as the anti-Facebook, okay, trading on this emotion that we're all feeling, the negative emotion against Facebook. Now, they say they will never sell ads. Now, I don't know how you get to a certain scale or when they see tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of people coming in, how they're going to afford this. You know, the URL is E-L-L-O dot C-O, which spells El Loco, for those of you that are paying attention. <laughs> the crazy. We'll see if they can make it work. But what they're doing is they're trading on mistrust in Facebook. Okay, it's a business opportunity for them. No one ever trusted the IRS, right? And when Lois Lerner got up there last year and pleaded the fifth when she was asked about whether there was partisan targeting going on, people kind of raised their eyebrows, like, oh, of course, she's hiding something. And she came out just a couple of weeks ago and said, well, I've done nothing wrong. Well, the logical conclusion when you're a member of the public, and I'm not, a, I'm not looking to go into constitutional law or politics or anything here, is when somebody takes the fifth, they're trying to hide something. Yet when they say they've done nothing wrong, well, why'd you take the fifth? Right? The government has a real problem right now with trust. It's not going to get any better anytime soon, I don't think. Oh, Bendgate. <laughs> or as I like to call it, Bendgazi. Um, you know, Apple had some headaches, uh, some PR headaches a couple of years ago when uh, they had Antenna Gate. Remember that? that the, suddenly the, the iPhone, I think it was the 4S, was dropping calls. And what was Steve Jobs' response? You're holding it wrong. <laughs> it's not us, it's you. Well, they managed to repair that, both reputationally and physically. But now you've got Bendgate. Now, I don't know if you heard the exact story as to how the iPhone got bent in the first place. This is the iPhone 6 Plus. It was a guy who admittedly was out for 18 hours traveling to and attending some wedding. And he had the iPhone 6 Plus in his front pocket of his suit. Now, I don't know what kind of dancing he was doing at the wedding to do that, but first of all, if you're a grown man and you're wearing a suit, there's probably like about five pockets up top here that you have to choose from. And I'm not the only one that kind of ridicules that because uh, T-Mobile CEO John Ledger, who is pretty outspoken, both in person and on Twitter, um, he weighed in on Ben Gate. <laughs> right? It defies logic why someone would do this. And, and he said, when you look at the video, the guy, he actually, ha his, you can see like the veins almost popping out in his neck and his, his knuckles turning white, right, trying to bend this thing. And by the way, just an hour before I took the stage here, I saw a trending article on Mashable that says the Samsung Galaxy Note 4 is also bendable when you put it through that kind of condition. Somebody out there must be working on some enterprising video series called Will It Bend? Sure. We had other brands weighing in. 
right? Now, I got to hand it to Kit Kat. I think they managed to single-handedly steal the mantle of real-time marketing from Oreo. Because we're sick of hearing of Oreo. When that, that dunk in the dark tweet during the Super Bowl, Kit Kat did this, I mean, right on brand. And I'll tell you what, I retweeted it, and I was thinking about it for the rest of the day, and I was out at the supermarket that night, and I'm standing in line, and I go, huh, there's Kit Kat. <laughs> I bought a Kit Kat because of their tweet. You know, you talk about ROI, but there are so many brands that are trying this real-time marketing stuff and falling flat on their faces. I was followed the other day by Charmin. I don't know why I want to talk to toilet paper, but <laughs> I do appreciate their potty humor, though. It's uh, pretty interesting. So when you look at the brands that are the most and least trusted, you've got a big problem if you're in the cable or internet service provider area or your name rhymes with U.S. Scareways. Well, let me give you a quick side story here, too. I had a run-in with U.S. Airways the other day. I live in the Detroit area. I'm still a remnant of my Ford Association. 80% of the flights in and out of Detroit are Delta, which they used to be Northwest until Delta acquired them. And I've got to think that if Alfred Hitchcock were still alive, North by Delta just would not have flown. So I'm sorry. Just bear with me. You know, I know it's been a long day for me, too. So, so I, I, uh, I planned some travel on U.S. Airways in a couple of weeks, and I looked to go download their mobile app because I like to just breeze through TSA. I get my, uh, my app with my um, uh, boarding pass on it. And I started looking at the reviews on iTunes, and there were only maybe 22 reviews going back two months. And you know how many stars they had? One. One star. And every single review said, do not download this app. It's a piece of crap. It doesn't do what it says, blah, blah, blah. So I tweeted US Airways. And I said, just an FYI, you guys might want to check out your reviews on iTunes for your mobile app. And I got a tweet back that was just standard scripted customer service BS. We're always looking for ways to improve our app. Well, that's nice, but it's been out for two months. It's never worked. I think you'd be looking for ways to implement those fixes, not looking for ways to improve it. It's pretty clear that if it doesn't work, make it friggin' work. You know, if you're doing stuff to piss people off, the first thing to do is stop doing that stuff. Social media, marketing, communications, everything, that's not a solution. You know, uh, back in 2006 at Ford, when we took out a little home improvement loan to the tune of $23 billion, the company, that was the last ditch effort for the company. And somebody on the board turned to the VP of communications and said, we have a PR problem. And he said, no, we don't. We have a business problem. And we need to get to the root of the business problem and have a plan in place to fix that. And then the PR will work itself out. Right? So if you've got a problem with your product or your service, fix that first, then go back and work on the marketing. So if you're not trusted, what are you going to do? This, for a long time, was the response. No, we don't want to get involved in that. It's the, you know, the ostrich with the head in the sand. And I don't know about you, but I look at these guys and I always think, oh, it's our legal team. <laughs> you know, the people that put the no in innovation. Right? But you got to get out there. Right? The promise of social. This is a, an old chart, but I think it still stands today. All of this stuff that's going on, all of these ways to connect, and notice what's at the center of that. You. 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 The customer. 
How many people have ever seen an org chart for a business or an organization that's actually got the customer listed on the org chart? It's a rare organization that does that, but the ones that do are the ones that really get it, right? But that's not the way that social has worked out. Let me give you a prime example that illustrates exactly why everything is going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard, Kim Kardashian is releasing a book, 352 pages of selfies. Anybody gonna buy that one? Well, certainly not. You can get it all on Instagram. But self-absorption isn't just for celebrities, it's for brands too. And that's kind of where we're stuck. And you think about the ways that we have traditionally reached out to consumers, the ways that marketing has evolved over the course of the 20th century. Whether it's radio, the advent of radio advertising, or television, uh, billboards, it's been a way to present information to people, to talk at them, to let them digest stuff about you. Right? So that's the way it was. But what about now? Well, if you want a good laugh, go to the condescending corporate brand page on Facebook that pulls out all of the foibles and gaffes and missteps that brands make in attempting to be relevant in trying to, to, to get their message out. Right? That's not why people are on Facebook. They're not there to hear from brands. And what's happened is we've taken that old style of advertising, of traditional mass marketing and mass media, and we brought it forward to the internet, and we started using that with banner ads and uh, pop-ups and splash displays and all of that. And then we've simply taken that and plopped it down onto social. It's a system that's broken two times over. And we're still trying to make it work. And we're wondering why brands are upset that they're not seeing good results on Facebook. And how dare Facebook ratchet down organic reach. Well, if brands were actually producing content that people cared about and naturally organically shared, it wouldn't be so difficult. So this is just as much in the, in the laps of the brands as it is in front of Facebook. And why are we doing this when consumers tell us what's important to them? They don't care as much about the brands or the products. They, they care about what it makes them feel. They care about the experience. I'll give you a great example of a couple of brands that actually did it right for a brief flash. It was a couple of years ago on Twitter, and Old Spice tweeted with no brand names, no at mention of another brand. They said, um, we think selling fire sauce is false advertising. It's not really made out of fire. Now, if you're not aware, in the little packets that you get at Taco Bell, fire sauce is one of their flavors. And Taco Bell, without any prompting at all, jumped right back in, back at Old Spice, and said, yeah, but is your product really made of Old Spices? <laughs> and suddenly, there's this brand smackdown going on, right? The reason it worked at the time is because it was a very human kind of interaction. We could see ourselves doing a smackdown like that with our best friend or with somebody at school or somebody at work that we joke around with, right? So that gave, what did it deliver to people? It delivered a laugh. It made people feel a certain way, and that way was not annoyed. And yet, Tom Fishburne, who writes at Marketunist, just posted this a couple of weeks ago. If you take the seven deadly sins, and you apply them to how a lot of brands act on social, he nailed it. Lust, sloth, gluttony, pride, greed, envy, wrath. I guarantee you, you've seen updates like this nearly every day in your feed. Right? It's always about me. Me, me, me for the brand. 
but enough about me. Let's see what you think about me, right? And this is nothing new. Almost 10 years ago, Hugh McLeod made this cartoon. It's still relevant today. Still is. So when I think about social strategy and the way I handled it when I was at Ford, we subscribe to the Woody Allen theorem. You know what the Woody Allen theorem is? You know, Woody Allen famously said 80% of life is just showing up. Well, so social media. It's about being where people expect you to be and not forcing them to be where you want them to be, right? So it's understanding trends, it's listening to your customer, it's being where they expect you to be. And any good theorem has a corollary. So we, of course, call on that other great philosopher, Yogi Berra, for the Yogi Berra corollary to the Woody Allen theorem of social media. And that is, it's the other half that's hard. Yogi was not a math guy. Probably would have made a good PR guy, I guess. The point I'm trying to make there is that it's what you do when you show up that matters. It's how you actual, actually deliver value to people. Right? If they're taking time out of their day and they already are skeptical of you as far as trust, what are you doing to repay them for spending that valuable time? Are you making them laugh? Are you creating a debate? Are you informing them? Are you settling an issue with customer service, for example? There's lots of different ways to think about creating value and adding something to someone's day. Why? So they come back for more. You're not going to do that by advertising at them. I love this photo because it captures the old and new. And uh, I believe this is in Rome, one of, the, uh, one of the sections of the forum with an ancient amphitheater. And the reason I bring this up is not because uh, I'm a travel blogger or something like that. I actually was a classics major as an undergrad, ancient Greek and Roman stuff, history and art and architecture and politics and sports. And I never really considered that I could be global head of social media for anything when I was a classics major. We didn't have any of that back then, first of all. And I didn't really appreciate the education as much as I have in the intervening years. And the thing that I've realized is when you think about these ancient times and the way people acted back then, it's interesting. We were talking about football last night at dinner, the NFL, the AFL. And I just saw that Australian Football League uh, uh, demonstration. It's like the modern-day gladiators. We still have that bloodlust in a certain way, and it's why we will forgive the NFL for any transgressions and keep going back to that which fuels us, the bread and circuses. But what I've realized in that the intervening two, 3,000 years since ancient times is as much as technology has changed, as much as language has changed, as much as geography has changed, humans have not. We are still the same beings that we were back then. We still want the same things. What is that? We want what's in it for us and the people that we care about, our friends, our family, the people that are close to us. We're looking out for our own. All right? That's the first thing. The second is we want to be, so big. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Right? We want to be able to make an impact. So whether it's joining a protest in Hong Kong, for example, or being part of a crowdfunded activity, or seeing your face up on a user-generated content-fueled billboard in Times Square. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And the third thing is we want to make a lasting impact in the world. We want to make a difference to society and to the people that we care about. Right? And if you understand those three fundamentals of human nature, they will take you far in what you do 
as marketers, as communicators, as brands, as you try to relate to your customer. And it was true in Julius Caesar's time, and it's true now. You knew I'd squeeze a Sherlock Holmes reference in here, right? This is a great quote out of one of the books, and it's, it's not unique. There's a couple of quotes like this, but basically, Sherlock Holmes said to one of the inspectors that you need to study what's happened before to understand how people act now. Right? So having employees, quite frankly, that understand psychology and sociology and history, in my mind, is way more important than finding somebody who knows how to work Facebook or how to get the latest update to Twitter on your phone. Right? It's people that understand the fundamentals of business and that understand the fundamentals of human nature. I was in a, uh, a store in a suburb not too far from where I live uh, a couple of months ago. And it was, it, was, it was like a narrow little storefront, you know, and the, the walls were just stacked with stuff. Jams and magnets and all like Michigan type stuff. And there were baskets hanging above. I kind of had to duck around a few times. And when I got up to the register, way in the back of the store, and it was like an old, you know, hand push register, and the little old lady was there. She had a piece of paper posted up over the cash register that I couldn't help but notice. And I took a photo of it, and it reminded me of what we're in this for. Right? I don't know how long ago this was printed or posted. Maybe it was in a Reader's Digest at some point. None of you remember Reader's Digest, I'm sure. It was in my grandmother's bathroom. That's, um, but the point here, as I, was in, as I was on Main Street in Northville, Michigan, I realized that we need to reclaim the Main Street tradition in social. We need to understand who's the most important here and how to act. Remember those days when I, I'm, I know when I was a kid, I would walk into the bank with my mom or my dad, and he would be greeted by name, by the teller, by the vice president. They'd ask about me, how I was doing in school. Now, you've got to get three forms of ID and a fingerprint before you get out of there. Right? How we've dehumanized the experience in so many of the businesses that we take part in, whether it's online or off. And why don't we remember about the basics of business, about getting to know someone, asking about them, about eye contact and about a firm handshake, when your word is your bond, right? Those are the values that fueled so much of the growth that we all know here in the USA. And I think it's still absolutely as relevant in social and digital. One of my favorite marketing quotes ever if you wish to persuade me, you must think my thoughts, feel my feelings, and speak my words. This wasn't said by Seth Godin or Andrew Carnegie or anybody like that. Not even by Scott Miller. It was said 2,000 years ago by Cicero. Now, if Cicero knew how to get inside people's heads, Without this kind of mass medium, then I'm sure we can do the same today. So when you think about how you want to do this, no matter where you are in the world and where your customer is, it's pretty simple. There's a formula. First, you have to have good products. Like I said before, if you have a crappy product or service, it's going to get out there. Actually, I will pull out one of my long-standing impersonations just for this audience. You ever, did you ever see the 1980 Bill Cosby special himself? He had the dentist routine and natural childbirth and all that. Well, in the one area, he was talking about his friends who liked to get drunk and uh, one who in particular liked cocaine. And he said, I never really understood why people like cocaine. So I said to my friend, why is it that you like cocaine? And my friend said, well, you see, it intensifies your personality. And I said, yes, but what if you're an asshole? 
right? So think about what people can say about you online, and if you haven't gotten this part figured out yet, how that will amplify your personality. Like I said, you want to give them engaging content. You want to give them value for the time they're spending with you. And value has many different meanings, and you can slice it and dice it any way that makes sense for your brand. But thinking of your customers' wishes, desires, and feelings first, and remembering Cicero, especially when you need to speak like them. How many people have heard the, uh, the saying, we regret any inconvenience you may have experienced? <laughs> Who talks like that? <laughs> Lawyers, right? But people don't respond to that kind of thing. They, they, if you said, oh, hey, I'm sorry. Let me see what I can do for you. Oh, that's a pain, right? Empathize with them. Help them understand that you are a human, too. This is a two-way street, right? There's plenty of places for us to have conversations with them. And that's why listen is down here as the last step. But really, it should be the first step. And the reason it's twice as big as the other fonts here is because I guarantee you, everybody had a grandmother at one point who said, you have two ears and one mouth. Use them in that proportion. <laughs> if only more brands did that in social. And speaking of listening, you've heard of this guy. Not really a big fan of crowdsourcing, <laughs> Mr. Henry Ford. Right? This is the guy who said, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> Interesting sidebar about that, actually. The original Ford vehicles, the company was founded in 1903. The original vehicles were different colors, just bright greens and reds and blues and yellows. As a matter of fact, before I left Ford, we had in our lobby the oldest known surviving Ford vehicle. It was put up for auction a couple of years ago, and it was bought anonymously. The bidder turned out to be Bill Ford, Henry's great-grandson. And he reminded us that it was not always only black. The reason that it went to all black is because that was the color that would dry the fastest coming out of the manufacturing line. And at a certain point in the 1920s, Ford was manufacturing 50% of all cars in the world. So you can bet your bottom dollar that they wanted them to dry as quickly as possible. Okay, but listening, as we know, is important. And unless, you, unless you're a visionary like Henry Ford or like Steve Jobs, it's your responsibility to listen to your customers. And believe me, they don't need prompting. If you can't see, it says, if there's anything we can do to make your stay more pleasant, just rant about it all over the internet. <laughs> there are entire customer service departments that have grown up now in the digital space to respond to this kind of stuff. Because people, they're standing right in front of you, and they won't tell you. They're just going to get on their device and blast it out to the world. And maybe, depending on the number of followers they have, they'll get the attention that they're seeking. A lot of times I had our customer service team come to me with a conundrum. Should we respond to this guy? And I just, I open the account and I go, well, look, I mean, he just opened his Twitter account yesterday. He's got zero followers. You tell me. <laughs> right? So there is a hierarchy that we put into, uh, into that kind of response. So I want to share with you a story about how you shouldn't take customer feedback, literally. This is the 2003 F-150. And customers told Ford that there wasn't enough room in the bed, in the back of the truck, to store all of their stuff. So Ford said, OK, here, focus group, what would you guys do? And they said, well, why don't you raise the edges of the bed and then you know, create more depth? That way, you don't have to lengthen the wheelbase at all. And it becomes a pretty uh, cost-effective manufacturing exercise. Ford said, OK. So they did that. Right? So you've got the higher edges. Customers came back, and they said, well, now it's, it's really hard for us to like, reach down and get stuff out of the bottom of the truck. You know, and, and, and Ford said, OK, well, what should we do? Any guesses as to what they said? 
Yeah, lower the sides. Yeah, okay, genius. We just, we just did that. So what Ford did is they observed how customers actually use the product. And they saw that a lot of them would be, they'd step up on that rear wheel, right? It's kind of an additional step to get down inside the truck. But if you're balancing on a wheel, right? I'm, I'm having trouble balancing on the stage, right? And you're carrying something, that's a little dangerous. So rather than literally taking the customer at their word, Ford created a simple sidestep. That you just push a button on the side, it pops out, and people can step up and reach down into the bed of the truck. You would have never gotten that from a customer, right? But by observing behaviors, and that's so important in the social space because you can't necessarily take everyone literally. I'll give you another example. Um, a lot of times we heard from enthusiasts that they wanted, um, they wanted more station wagon type vehicles, or they wanted more manual transmissions to shift. Bottom line is only about 1% to 2% of vehicles sold in the United States are manual shift. And we found over time that while they would say that, very few of them would actually line up at the dealership and actually make the purchase. So we would have made millions and millions of dollars of investment in engineering and manufacturing and design to create something that no one was actually going to buy. Right? So that's, it's important to test your assumptions and to test what people are telling you rather than just taking them at their word. One way we did this at, uh, at Ford is we had a, a site called Ford Social, which was originally started as the Ford Story back during the bailout hearings. And we needed to make it clear that we were different than the other two, so we needed a place to tell our own story. But we evolved the site, so it was more than just storytelling and more than just photos. We gave people an opportunity to submit their own stories and their own photos and videos, but we also gave them a forum to share their ideas, to tell us what they wanted in their vehicles. And it could be, you know, we need a flying car, or we need more station wagons, whatever it is. But then we gave the community the opportunity to vote on it. And we gave our product strategy team access to it to see what people were saying. A completely transparent community. And what would end up happening is engineers would jump into the comment section and an idea that maybe was literal when it started out began to evolve. And based on the feedback that people were giving us and based on the insights that the engineers were having, the idea would then potentially come to market. Last I heard, there were over 5,000 ideas that were in submission and review on the site. But I got to tell you, there is one image that I used to keep on my desktop to remind me of the dangers of crowdsourcing. Any Simpsons fans in the audience? Seven, OK. Well, that show must have jumped a shark at some point. You remember the Homer mobile? Season two, episode 15, Homer found that he had a long lost half brother, Herb Powell, who ran Powell Motors in Detroit. And just as he discovered that, Herb was in the boardroom complaining to the executives that, I think it was, uh, it was Danny DeVito that was Herb. He said, you're not asking the customers what they want, you're telling them what they want. And he's, he basically said, we need a real, regular customer to come in here and help us design our next car. And then Homer walked in, and the game's over, right? He gives Homer full control of the product development, and at the auto show, they reveal this. It costs $110,000, and the horn plays La Cucaracha. But that's the danger of letting this go out of control and not having your arms around it and taking part in the community that you're trying to build. Because if you're going to do this right, if you're going to spend time reclaiming what social should be, talking with people, understanding them, letting them know that they're important, you're going to build a relationship with them. And ultimately, that's what this is all about. And lest you think that I'm going to let you get away without another classics reference, relationship comes from the Latin word relatio, 
kind of reminds me of a uh, big fat Greek wedding. You know, when the father used to say every, every word he heard, he said, oh, the, the Greek root to that is uh, potukales, it means door. But this is, this is true. Rolatio is the Latin word to mean to carry back or to bring back. And if we think about those core values, those human, the human nature that I mentioned, and the core values of Main Street USA that we can bring back to social, we have it within our power. We have the ability to create a more lasting and engaging relationship with our customers. So, oh, sorry, one last Latin reference. Quod erat demonstratum. This is one of my favorite cascades of tweets. Chris Lovett said, I only bought a Ford because of Twitter. I often used to show this when dealers would say, oh, social media, that doesn't work. But he said, I bought the Ford because my interest was piqued via Twitter and a relationship created and to make a great escape. Right? Got to have the product before anything else. And he goes on to explain to Alan, they built a relationship with me. I trust Ford. Right? So it's not that difficult for human nature and for understanding and interaction to help build that relationship that ultimately leads to a more trusted organization. The woods are lonely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you. Take a question or I would love to take questions. Or does everybody just want to get the cocktail hour? <laughs> I, I don't blame you. Okay. <laughs> Anything. Personal questions, statistics, uh, favorite flower. I, you know, we, we can go anywhere. All right, there's one. Let's hope it's not any of the above. <laughs> hey, Scott. Um, question is, so you gave a great example, um, the car that Homer created, um, which I guess is classic. You, you obviously don't want to take things literally, but do you have a methodology to share around how to kind of create a sense of um, uh, belonging and, and getting the right kind of feedback in a timely manner, but still... Um, uh, you know, not letting things get out of hand. Is right. there a certain methodology or certain things that we should keep in mind to do that? Well, I, th I think it's going to vary based on your community, based on what it is that you're trying to achieve. But I think a, a couple of things come to mind. Um, one, you want to give people parameters. You don't want to just, you know, do a blue sky approach because you'll get everything. And there was a, a presentation earlier in the day that mentioned the signal to noise ratio. There's an awful lot of unstructured data out there. You know, and the goal is to make it structured and to drive insights from that data. Um, so the more you can you know, kind of create a finite set of questions or a finite set of guidelines, I think that's important. The other thing is I think it's important to be part of a, re a, a review process all the way along and to have the end users. You know, in our case, we had the product strategy team. We didn't have the social media team reviewing all of those ideas. The social media team may look at it and go, oh, heated windshield wipers, that sounds cool. And the product team goes, what are you, crazy? You know what that's going to cost? Right? So I think bringing the right team members together and to have regular check-ins at certain points is absolutely critical. And then the last thing I would say is the feedback loop is really important. Letting your community know what you're doing with what it is that they say. It's one thing to just you know, have a whole list of ideas up there. But if I got back to you and I said, hey, guess what? We're putting your idea into production next year, and we're going to give you the first ride in that new vehicle with your feature in it. What are you going to do at that point? You're going to tell the world about it. And certainly the people in the community are going to see that kind of interaction. That's going to incent them to want to participate more. So I think with those three kinds of steps in mind, you should be fairly well equipped to, uh, to handle the craziness of crowdsourcing. 
So Scott, you, you spoke very eloquently about the limitations of social, but as many of us in the room know, um, it's often inside a lot of the companies we work at, the social department is getting more and more power. Um, more and more people are listening to what uh, that department is saying in terms of customer behavior, customer interactions. So how can many of us as insight professionals find a way to work more closely, more effectively with folks on the social side so that we can bring some of that trust and authenticity and reality um, that we often have at our fingertips but that isn't necessarily being translated through Twitter or Facebook? Yeah, um, I think it's a great question, Nick. And I think it comes through, I think it partly comes through executive communication. Now let me explain what I mean by that. So you've got your social team, which you know, their reporting probably varies. And I will guarantee you that a number of them are reporting on the number of likes they got on the retweets, et cetera. Now, if you, got, if you put that in front of a CEO, get out of here. You know, what, what does that mean to the bottom line? What does that mean to our business objectives? Our business objectives are not to get more likes, right? And by the way, I didn't, I didn't share this nugget, but I have a shorthand. I, I think that um, if you want to talk about Facebook, the, the increasing aura of importance are likes, comments, and shares. The like is like a digital grunt. Uh. Uh. The comment, all right, unless you're the guy that goes first, the comment is a, is a sense of engagement, right? But a share, that means you've created something that they care enough about to be able to put in their own timeline to their friends. And that's when you know you've connected. So how do you actually take that and translate that to, and, and I hate you know, putting social and ROI together because I think social has an unfair burden in terms of sales when it's more about brand awareness. But you have to take that and translate it to the language that executives are used to understanding. And the social team can probably only get so far in anecdotal uh, examples or in um, you know, overall volume. It's your teams that are the ones that draw the insights. And, and maybe it's not literally just from what your customers are saying. Maybe you know of a trend going on over here, and you see some stuff happening within your own community here, and you bring the two together. And you say, all right, if, we, if we're hearing this, and there's this going on, here's something that we need to be doing to bridge that gap. Right? So I think that's the, the analytics and the research profession's responsibility, is to partner with social and help translate to executive speak as to how to get things to move through. And bottom line is, most of social is controlled by marketing these days, because that's where the budget is. Right? But you've got partners in customer service. You've got partners in communications. There's lots of different ways to bring it all together. We had a question down front here. Do you think Facebook has seen its best days? Wait, is that a loaded question or what? <laughs> Have you stopped beating your wife yet? Um, um, look, they always surprise. And with 1.3 billion members worldwide, with entries into the visual medium like Instagram, um, they're actually producing an anonymous application now to go along with Secret and Whisper. Um, they will stay on top of things. Oh, Oculus Rift, right? I think there's a whole section there in the gaming community. I think there's a huge future in gaming and, and multimedia player, uh, uh, multiplayer uh, games. Um, and I think Facebook is not going to be a one-trick pony. I think it's going to be like the General Electric of its time. It's going to be a conglomerate, and there's going to be a lot of different business units there. And yeah, a lot of it's going to be driven by advertising, because no matter what platform you're going to be working on, it's going to need advertising to support it. And brands want to be present where people are. So I think there's a lot of life left in Facebook yet. And disclosure, I own no Facebook stock. OK. Drinks are on Scott. <laughs> <laughs>